Right on time. Wow. Okay, I got to sign up to the song. Let me, let me hit. Do you get that message where it says, are, are we recording? And you got to hit yes or no. Do you get that yeah. too? No, yeah, I that's a liability that. message. Liability message. Yeah, because you have to, like, if you're recording in a meeting with people, you have, like, you have to give them, like, X, like, you know, basically, we're recording this. Is everybody okay with it? So that's why that comes up. That is it being recorded, oh, live stream, okay. whatever. Okay, whatever. <laughs> yep. So oh, I just felt the liability message. The liability message. Yeah. The liability message. Okay. Right, so anyway, that's cool. Chat. That is cool. That is cool. All right, good morning, everybody. All oh, one person who's watching this. It's probably me. Good morning yeah. to you too. Thanks for thanks for thanks for the greeting. Anyway, yeah, we'll get going with this. Yeah. Oh, I'm like koozie here. I have a freaking stupid thing here. I don't know, Mayor. I don't know. I'm all disheveled today. I'm all discombobulated. I got college hockey on the brain today. So that's going to be my challenge today. I just saw this great comment, and I think it was like it's on our Claiborne episode. Um, it's from one of our subscribe, obviously one of our subscribers, but I think it's in reference to that quote I read, how Claiborne felt about Helena. He said, whenever people today claim about complain about how dangerous some U cities are in the u.s um the 1850s shows up and says hold my beer i think he's referring to that quote i read about helena that when claiborne got there he was like jesus what is this place oh wow, you have wild shootouts in the middle of the street i mean it's something yep. you know but i don't know that's pretty morning cool. barbara and elsie oh hey elsie said hello in seinfeld voice hello how about hello, 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 how about, how about, hello, hello. oh god for the ptsd <laughs> oh and autumn says hi from pittsburgh and jim kelvin hi pittsburgh pa very underrated city mary just telling you home of the in my opinion the best ballpark in america for the pnc love that ballpark. i did get to see three rivers before it closed down but anyway we're not going to talk sports we're not talk sports. no no we're not no. <laughs> anyway yeah so go with this so yeah so everything going okay it looks like you have some sort of aura going on today with the light behind you with that background. I don't know what's going on with it. Looks like you have a ghost backpack on. Yeah, I think it's because I don't have the light on, but whatever. Okay, well, I live in the mm. wild dream. So what's going on? What's what's happening? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Calvin said, this inter this is interrupting my playing of War of Rights, but I had to ditch him to all the <laughs> and you have to submit oh. a video game. Well, that's high, pra high praise right there. But anyway, so what's Welcome, going on Calvin. with you? Yeah, so it's a cold and clammy and rainy, crappy yeah. day here, like it seems to be every day here. Uh, but spring is a coming, so we're looking forward yeah. to that. And um, we'll definitely look forward to that. So, yeah, so we had some had some fun. We got a bunch of cool stuff cooking that we did. We did the, the episode on Patrick Claiborne yesterday, if Mary, I assume you remember. You yep. uh, know, we had, we had a lot of fun with that. We can talk about that a little bit. We could talk about the episode three of the Manhunt series, which we watched last night. Yep um that was okay i mean it was i mean it yeah was, it's not it, i mean yeah well yeah it, it, i was kind of like eh, it's not i don't know i still like as far as people playing john wilkes booth i still like jesse johnson a lot better yeah he's he's the best one i mean he's I don't just think... more emotional he's just more emotional i don't think booth at the point where they're in the pine thicket i don't think he was that level of arrogant where he's like oh yeah i'm gonna get my diary published it's gonna be in libraries like i was like no dude i think by this point you were probably like uh yeah we're effed you know yeah no it's i mean we'll see we'll see but anyway so yeah so we'll enjoy we'll enjoy doing this and you know it always is a lot of fun but i think yeah i think you know we'll talk about that that manhunt thing in a little bit and that that's i like it and you know it's so funny was you know what for a lot like a lot of people my first uh foray into history going back back in the day was the lincoln assassination the conspiracy the chase everything that comes with it and so i've always been really really into into this this part of history so I'll, of course i'm going to enjoy it and there are people on there who are pissy because it's not 100 percent accurate and stuff yeah. like that and it's, and it's not but take it for what it is but I, I mean what i what i pay attention to with this is kind of how much they have the characters and how much they they have the personalities and i think you're right but you know most reports if you read if you read kaufman if, if, if you read some of these books um uh, uh they talk about how arrogant he was in the in the pine thicket yeah um the the the, the character that they've really they really nailed so far was swan yeah okay that 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 black guy in in um in maryland who kind of got them through the the zakaya swamp and down because and he because he was someone who 
who I, you know was was very much uh, they had that one done pretty well, and they had Doctor Mud. They have they've had his character done pretty well too. So we'll we'll talk about that more in a little bit. But I but I, I I'm not gonna lie to you. I don't like the the actor who's playing Booth. I no. don't, and I didn't like him in that masters of the universe show we watched yes. either i i enjoyed okay. him in masters of the air but only because like his name was harry crosby and my great uncle who was a bomber in world war ii his name was larry crosby and i got to kind of see what he would have done so i thought that was really cool but no i i definitely am not like i just keep thinking like god jesse johnson was such a good booth like just even like right down to like i was remember last week and we were looking at pictures of Jesse Johnson, even when he's not Booth, he looks like Booth. The thing, the thing that separates Jesse Johnson in this Crosby guy is John Wilkes Booth. You know, he was like like Bill Shatner back in the day, where everything, every time he talked, it sounded like he was on stage. You know, where you yeah. just talk to him, you you run into Bill Sh William Shatner at a bar, and he's like, you know, well, as you know, yeah, I am drinking an old fashioned. <laughs> that's how but that's how booth was yeah. and jesse johnson had that in this this kid is is i don't know i i like the i like the series i, I like the history part of it um they they've they've kind of stereotyped a lot of the characters they they you know the difference between robin wright who played mary surratt in the conspiracy movie and yeah. the mary surratt in this one is this one's very whiny yes you know um, and she sounds like she's pissed because she isn't going to Florida when she wants, eh, yeah. right? Yeah. But I, I, I enjoy it. I, um, the, but it's ripe with historical errors. But you know, something like we said when we met with with Sonny Williams, the astronaut, a few weeks ago. Yeah. Um, I asked her if she liked Star Wars, and I was surprised when she liked it because all the historical errors. She's like, it's fun. It's a fun movie. It's, yeah. It doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to be balls on accurate to be enjoyable. So to no. take it for what it's – and truth be told, most people who watch this series aren't going to know the subtle historical errors anyway. So no. who cares? Just enjoy it. No, it's, it's like the worth. movie I mean, like Braveheart or Gladiator where if you teach in that field, you either hate it or you enjoy it. You take it for what it is. You recognize that there's historical inaccuracies. And I definitely – like you and I definitely recognize the historical inaccuracies. But it's like, well, you know what? If at the end of the day someone watches this who's not into it and they're like, wow, I want to learn more about this the series has done its job that's the thing it's like it's historical fiction if, if people not, you know so, so one of our friends is dave taylor and people i don't know if people know who he is but he you know he's probably one of the most just, preeminent sorry. boothy historical people anywhere right now he used to live in maryland he lives in texas now ironically in granbury texas of all things yeah. and we've been we've been reaching out to him and about what he thinks of the episode and, and when this whole thing is done we're going to do an episode with him about talking specifically about uh, about this mini series manhunt, so that'll be fun. So if you're, so if you're if you're into this, I mean, check check it out. We'll have him on. Um, he's he's a good laid back dude. He he's enjoying it and he's saying the same things we are with it. So anyway, check it out. So we'll, that'll that'll be cool. So we'll have. Yep, we'll I just have fun with I that. just posted a link to Dave Taylor's website in the comments. If anybody he's he's reviewing each episode as it goes. They're long reviews, but they're really good because like. Um, you learn about the history he's talking about like okay well here's what happened and here's like what actually happened so he's very good about breaking it down um autumn says she feels the same way about the movie gettysburg if it gets someone interested that's awesome that's how i feel too i'm like yeah the gettysburg like there's some roll your eye moments with it's like oh god here we go again and it's created well, a lot of myths about the battle but it gets people into it gettysburg yeah. gettysburg is is a bromance set in a theme of a war that's the difference. The focus yeah. isn't about as silly as it sounds. The focus is not the the battle at Gettysburg. It's the relationship between Hancock and Armistead, and, yeah. and then it's stuff going around it. That's what it is. But you know, Gettysburg is more accurate than it's not. Um, if you want to talk about historical movies that are completely wrong, Glory is completely wrong. Yeah. I mean, I'm just saying. I mean, there's, you couldn't. That movie is more is more wrong than right, but it's still enjoyable. People yeah. people look at Glory. Like it's the the best Civil War movie, and it's up there. But um, if you really study the fifty fourth Mass and you look at some of the blatant wrongs, then then you'd be mortified. But most people don't get, don't study that that deep into that regiment. But it's still good. It's still good. Gods and Generals is wrong. 
But again, yeah. you know, you know, you're not reading Coddington or you're not reading, you know, um, McPherson or any of these 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 historical authors. So so take it for what it is. You can still yeah. enjoy it. But people getting bent out of shape because Stanton doesn't have a beard, stupid stuff yeah. like that. I saw someone I, I, get bent out of shape because the um the marching at the beginning of Manhunt wasn't pro- the soldiers weren't marching properly or weren't in proper order or something. And I was like, what? What average person? is going to notice that and i'm like that's you know if that's their opinion that that's totally cool but like don't let that <laughs> kind of be like i'm not watching this you know well i saw i saw it. one i saw one on, on the twitter where somebody was ripping the soldiers because the ammo pouch was on the wrong side yep it's like it's like okay and here's the thing you know why they're saying that mary because they can tell everybody how smart they are yeah yes that that's right <laughs> and i'm like oh my gosh stop you know but it's okay i mean i think i think it's cool i think anything historical on um is is fun but again i enjoy pawn stars because they talk history sometimes so who cares enjoyable what it's worth but don't be such a serious freaking stitch dickhead either like who cares just just enjoy it for what it is but in case it's fun I, i think it's pretty cool but i think um I think you know the good thing is if you if for the average person if you do notice the stuff that means you do know the history. I, I, that's like why people hate hate the what if game. My opinion yeah. is you're gonna do what if to history. You know what really happened, right? But take it for what it's worth. That's enjoyable. Just be glad that people are actually putting this stuff on right now. The yeah. Civil War is definitely a third rail in today's modern politics. So the fact they're putting stuff on, just enjoy it. Yeah, just exactly. Enjoy just it. enjoy it for what it is. Like you know get and you know if it, if you already are into it and you're enjoying it and get you reading more about that like if you're in the civil war and you don't know much about the assassination and get you reading about it that's another great thing too um morning lynn hey but, but that's it but it's, it's fun though it, it's definitely funny but i'm not you know i know we were planning on talk about this primarily but but i sometimes the most entertaining thing on social media is reading the people the measuring contests yeah you know oh yeah exactly it's like they they just like Bill said they're looking for anything they to correct. You know, um, it's kind of like in this episode we just recorded. We when we discussed Spring Hill, we had both sides to what was happening. Um, yeah. We we had quotes regarding how angry Claiborne was after that breakfast, which he was not a part of, but he found out that Hood basically threw him under the bus. And we had a quote from Hood saying that Claiborne went to him and was like, I'm really sorry I didn't follow orders kind of thing, right? We don't know which is <sighs> accurate, but that's no. the thing. We like, like Spring Hill is probably what happened in between Spring Hill and Franklin is like, that's something I would love to be on the, like, it's love to see how that actually went down and what happened because the one person that could have set the record straight was killed. And so were five other people. Um, that could have kind of set the record straight and the ones that were left you know they're like well this is what happened kind of thing um oh, elsie said we need a patrick claiborne based film yes no that that would be a good one but, but again it's 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 it's, it's the thing the thing that the contrast with claiborne and this is the thing too speaking of claiborne and social media is his birthday was the other day yep. right and you know and there are people who sit who get all whatever about the his 16th versus the 17th and I, I mean most people who study this stuff really know that it was that it was like the 16th yeah. but it, it's it turns into he's some sort of drunken irish confederate who should have known better and stuff like that and really you when you when you look at claiborne it, it, it was i'm glad we did the episode the previous one on the irish brigade on yeah. Cor- corcoran and Marr and patrick kelly and all those guys because these this, these are different people. This is a different animal. This Patrick Claiborne. Yeah. He this is you know he and and you mentioned in the episode yesterday that you know he was from a somewhat of a privileged family. No, he was from a privileged okay. family. This was Spalding Smales growing up, Mary. Yeah. That's who this guy was. Um, and he didn't his his comparable was was Robert Gould Shaw. If you really think about it, except that because they really didn't give a crap less about slavery. They did. They yeah. didn't care. They were fighting for fighting for the, their respective countries, states, whatever. But he was somebody who came over here and when he truly found a home in Helena, when he ends up with Dr. Nash and Dr. Grant yeah. at that apothecary in Helena, and he got pumped into this Helena social circuit. Yeah. Uh, the, and the funny part about it is a drunken iron. She was a member of the temperance club yeah. in Arkansas. 
Well, which is hilarious in modern day Arkansas. So Arkansas angry. is a temperance club. But I mean, but that, but that's who he was, though. So if you're gonna take shots at people and you're gonna complain that Stanton doesn't have a beard, get your freaking history right on yep. the big picture, right? And, that, and that's and there's a lot of there's a lot of different reasons why people don't like Claiborne. And yep. a lot of it's because of the people you do like. Right. And, you, and yep. it goes back to that Ireland Chamberlain thing. Um, but he's an he's an interesting study because, you know, as we go and we talked a little bit about Spring Hill, we did a whole episode on Spring Hill. We did a whole episode on Franklin. But you're right, though, the conversation that took place in between, because there was someone, you know, Lucy, you got some explaining to do after yep. Spring Hill and people don't want to give John Schofield credit. For getting by yeah. they want they want to play the blame game they're passing out the blame pie right and if you're going to do that you have to decide okay if you are going to blame somebody for, for spring hill whose fault is it yeah. are you going to blame benjamin cheatham for allegedly not get, getting the order right from hood are you going to blame hood for here the, the buck stops here you're letting this happen but somebody for whatever reason gave Claiborne the impression that it was his fault. Yeah. Maybe he, maybe he did that himself. You know, may, maybe he went to miss Cleo and determined that's what happened. <laughs> but for, for whatever reason, there was a, and it's clear by the quotes specifically from, from major general John C. Brown, that Claiborne felt that this was on me. Now it might've been a situation where he just felt that he, he should have been there. Maybe yeah. somebody was blaming him. But um, a lot of the people who who don't like who don't like Claiborne feel that he's doing this to stick it to John Bell Hood. A lot of people who like John Bell Hood think he's making this, you know, he, that he's that he's making this up to to stick it to Claiborne. I don't know, and that's the we'll good never thing about know. history is nobody really knows. But it doesn't take away the fact of how. He's going to ultimately fight at the Battle of Franklin. He's going to get his get his, his ass killed here. Um, but if you read some of the quotes, and I don't mean some of the ones from Captain Irving Buck, the ones who are his Claiborne's BFFs. Yeah. But but the Brown quote's fascinating because Brown does he, he says afterwards that he asks Claiborne specifically whose fault Spring Hill was. According to John C. Brown, Claiborne told him that it was Hood's fault that he yeah. blames Hood. Because he's the one who's blaming him. But again, this is hearsay after the war. This goes back to the Longstreet Lee thing. Yeah. This goes to the Rosecrans Lee Grant yeah. thing. Yeah. And depending on what flavor of ice cream you like, you're going to pick one. But too many people go 100% in direction of the other to blame the other guy. The truth's probably somewhere in the middle. Yeah. I, but, I would. Um, I have my suspicions that Claiborne was probably angry, um, frustrated. They all are. At this point, I would be if I'm being the the army of Tennessee is not in good shape. Some of the men don't have shoes. It's, you know, it's end of November. It's like getting cold. Um, and you're kind of going on this wild goose chase. And, and for what? Um, you know, and I know that the, you know, Hood's like we can get Nashville or whatever. Like, you know, Jim Miller says like, oh, to be a fly in the wall, rip a villa that morning right. when that meeting happened to see that, to see how the blame pie was cut up and reading hood stuff i mean reading hood stuff and you know having read what i've read about claiborne um i tend to go more the john c brown with with that that he probably was angry i can't see claiborne going up to hood, hood and being like i'm so sorry well the yeah. one thing that the one thing that is clear is this was not a Robert E. Lee, it's, it's all my fault thing. It, it does not appear in any way <laughs> that Hood took any responsibility. And, and, and it, it does, doesn't, it, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing because you know something, maybe Claiborne did screw up. Yeah. Maybe he did and maybe he knows it and he got called out for it. But again, it, it totally dismisses that John Schofield did a good thing here. Yeah. Right. He he got this army by. He snuck by and he he got to Franklin, but um, either by either by Hood or by Claiborne's own whatever. Claiborne clearly felt that he was getting he was getting blamed in one yeah. one, one way or the other. They all and, did. I know Granberry. I think there's reports of him um, that he was angry too. That I mean, know, they I were think... they were all embarrassed. I mean, don't forget too. Yeah. You're talking about a guy 
who was carrying a torch from getting turned down from, from Trinity Medical School in Dublin. And he felt that it shamed his family. And he carried that for the rest of his life, this feeling yeah. of shame, this, this feeling of, I don't want to say imposter syndrome, but guilt. Uh, he, he may have been Anglo-Irish, but he carried that Irish guilt, right, yeah. for whatever reason. So there's probably some truth to that. Now, whether or not, you know, like in the movie Gettysburg with with Stuart, you know, with Jeb Stuart, that whole fabricated scene there yeah. about, you know. There you is know, no time for that. There is no time for that. There is no time. Yeah. But whether that meeting, a meeting like that happened between Claiborne and, um, you know, and, uh, and Hood, who knows? Maybe it did. Maybe it didn't. But again, that's why we study history, because there's a lot of gray area. But we do know people who are 100 percent on different sides of this. And that's yeah. just. And to the point when you're when you're calling people's opinions wrong, or stupid, uh, or stupid, or fanboys, that's ludicrous. I mean, yeah, people people should know better. I, oh, I'm yeah. sorry, I think people. Oh, but that's, I agree. That, but that's that's the reality. But but I think Claiborne's a fascinating study, and I I like Claiborne for a lot of different reasons. But I think he's someone who um who's definitely one that gets a lot of credit. But at the same point, he probably gets a little too much because yeah, he wasn't he wasn't the only general who was killed at Franklin. Exactly. There's and, there's five other generals there. And like as David Maxwell says, like Schofield definitely checkmate checkmated his own old West Point buddy, Hood. Um, they went to West Point together. And that's something like that doesn't get and talked And don't dismiss that either. I mean, yeah. you, you talk about the fact that there, there are people, A.P. Hill, had some issues with McClellan from West Point that goes back yeah. to the Battle of Antietam. So old, old, I, I have friends from college to this day when they do well, I'm happy for them, but I'm like, eh, fuck them. you know, that's yeah. kind of, that's just kind of how it is a little bit. But, at the, but at the same time, there's so much more personal relationships are tied into the story. Um, so it's, you know, could Hood sit there and say, well, you know, Schofield did a good thing, but I don't want to give him credit. So it had to have been a mistake we made. Uh, who knows who knows but that's but that's what's cool about it um but if someone you know like you know if someone told me one time that there are no superlatives in the civil war there is no 100 percent one way or the other there is no greatest there is no worst it's all interpretive but if you're if you're at the point when you find yourself saying stuff like that take a step back and look because yeah. this this it's never it's never black and white no it's never and it's not fair to like um you know i think Yes, there are fanboys, fangirls in this field, but to like say that is kind of, it's like, well, you don't know why somebody's studying that person or why they like them. And I know like, you know, Cham like some people say that Cham or Claiborne is kind of like Chaburn Chamberlain post Gettysburg, like with all the love he gets and blah, blah, blah. And it gets blown out of proportion. The one difference is that Claiborne didn't get to sit back and write um his story because he's killed tragically at Franklin. He's probably one of the, we didn't really get to this, but I think- he is one of the greater losses of the Civil War because we don't know he's brilliant. Like he's a brilliant speaker. He's very well known, well liked. Um, we don't know what he could have done post-war. And he's one of those ones that's like, well, what could he have been an aide to reconstruction? But the people that do get to write the stories are obviously Hood and Brown are both going to be slanted in how they write it because they want to, at the end of the day, you know, there is an agenda behind it. But they both get to write and Claiborne doesn't. And that's the thing is the one that we need with the one that we need the story is not available to write, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure that that's the thing is that's, that's part of the fun of studying this is you never really know how much of Patrick Claiborne. My opinion is Patrick Claiborne would have gone back to Arkansas and just stayed in Arkansas. Yep. I, I, I think I he would have led a pretty quiet life. I, I think, I think he was going to go out of the spotlight. I mean, he, he was a, you know, he was a good lawyer back when he was a law partner with Thomas Hinman back before the war. And he, I think his personality, he was somewhat aloof. He was somewhat distant. I think personally, he's not going to be, he's not going to be like John Mosby or he's not going to be like, certainly like James Longstreet and, and mm -hmm. be this. I think he's going to take his ball and go home and live his life. I, I He's probably going to go back with Sue Tarleton, live oh, yeah. his life, be Irish. We're going to have 77 children. And then he's, and, and then he, and then he's going to basically uh, call it a day that's what i think he would have done well that's the other thing too is there's sue in this picture as well she dies like four years later she does remarry but like you know she she does pass away um she's relative she's not even 30 when she passes away um and that's a sad part of the story too is they don't get like they had their wedding date set for june 1864 and what does claiborne do doing he's having to do the atlanta campaign so he can't um you know, and, and David Maxwell says, like, you know, he's talking about 
how bad Leonidas Polk is. Um, he says, I, all the crap I jokingly give Hood, he was good as Brigade and Division, but Polk was, yeah, Leonidas Polk. Is, ugh. But yeah, Hood is good at Brigade and Division. Yeah, and it, 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 this is one of those deals where it's like, well, you you can say Claiborne was really, really good with, without saying Hood was really, really bad. Because yeah. Hood wasn't, he was not really, really bad. He, I, you know, like anything else, people have their, people have their limits. You know, he's a, he, the, everybody has a glass ceiling and um, I don't, I don't buy into the whole laundrum stuff or any of that. I just think that he got over his skis a little bit. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody has their limits. Everyone has their caps. And he, as a core commander, especially leading really up to, up through Gettysburg. And he had his moments. I mean, he, again, he's, he's also going, by the time Hood takes over in Atlanta, he's going up against a monstrous Union army. Yeah. I mean, I mean, he, he, he goes out of Jones, bro. He's going to try to hit the Union there. But again, because of people like S.D. Lee who don't take orders well, you have you have that issue where the Jonesboro thing doesn't play itself out. He does go up and he does hit James Mc, Burbsy McPherson. Yeah, he does. He so he is aggressive, but he tries to go into northern Georgia, into northern Alabama. He's trying to pull Sherman out. And but Sherman's, Sherman's like, now, nah, okay, I'm good. He's he's, he's not going to take the bait. He's going to go to his march to the sea, and then he's going to see that Jones Schofield has two detached corps. So I'm going to go after them. Then I'm going to go up to them. so he so give give Hood credit here. He mm -hmm. does look of ways to stay aggressive and maintain keep that initiative on his side. Yeah. Um, but he's chasing that he's barking up the wrong tree because history is going to show that even if he takes Nashville, it's not going to make a difference. No, it, it won't. But, at but that but point, the, but, it won't. No, but at the time, it's a it's a big supply base. The Union has held Nashville forever, so it's a big feather in their cap. It's it's like when Yule. In the Gettysburg campaign, he's all set to go take Harrisburg. You kidding me? He's going to take yeah. Harrisburg, and he's got. I mean, he you could you could. He was so excited, and then Lee sends the order to fall back to the Cashtown Gettysburg area, and he just, are you shitting me? Because that was his big moment. And Yule up to that point was doing almost everything right. Yeah. He has a great, you know, second Winchester, all that stuff, and he's about to take he's about to take Harrisburg until he gets called back, but. Um, so he sees it as a big coup for him. And it would have been. It would have been. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for Schofield, um, and if he's able to bag them and he doesn't have to get bogged down in Franklin, you know, who knows how history is? Because don't forget, too, George, the, the rock of Mill Springs Thomas yeah. is sitting up and he's up and, you know, he's going to Tootsie's up there in Nashville, having a, having a great old time. And he's getting blamed for not for not coming out to hit Hood. Oh God, so, that so, that whole that whole fiasco still causes it like still causes debate among people. Like people who are like, well, Lincoln didn't quite understand what was going. No shit, he didn't. But Grant was also like, okay, now's my chance to get rid of this Thomas guy because I really don't like yeah. him. But don't forget Hood though. Um, before people think we're jumping all over Hood, Hood had to be aggressive because yep. that's why he was put in place. Jefferson Davis was tired of, of Joseph E. Johnson because he was being too passive. He was doing yeah. the whole Floyd Merriweather bob and weave thing to Sherman and wouldn't hit him. And falling back to Atlanta, when you bring out, you know, you, you bring out Hood, who's going to be, who is going to be aggressive and is aggressive. Yeah. Any general, any president wants an aggressive guy. That was the yeah. whole Lincoln McClellan thing. Yeah. So you can't bash Hood for being Hood. He is what he is. Yeah, that's why he was put in place. And it's not, I mean, my opinion is it was not the right choice. I think, you know, Hardy would have been much better at the job. Um, oh, the, Bill's got a question here. He said, was Claiborne a big writer early on? No, not really. No, we have like <laughs> scraps of his writing, basically, but not, there's a diary somewhere. Um, you could we, read his letters to Sue Tarleton. It sounds like a four-year-old writing a, you know. Oh God! You can also you read like, his poetry. Do you like me? Check one. Yes, no. I mean, that was God. the extent of Claiborne's love letters. But <laughs> like in his thirties, he's acting like this, like teenager, and she must have been like, oh God. No, he was not. He was not the the the, the Dan Sickles level writer and Dan oh, he was awkward. <laughs> no, if you read Sickles, a brilliant writer. If you read his, if you read his, his yeah, Claiborne was apparently a really good speaker. Um, because he gave the keynote address at a Masonic meeting. They had this big meeting and he he gave he was chosen to be the keynote speaker there. Um, so he was good at giving speeches, but when it like, you know, his writing and I've wrote well, what he said about Helena, Arkansas, where it's like this place is crazy. Yeah, was was really good. I, um, I had the general this morning. Oh my. 
Good for, good for you. Good for yeah, you. The, yeah. Oh yeah. AQ and MJ are talking about um, uh, Getty's gear coffee, which we also had this morning. It's excellent coffee. So yeah. Good. Yeah, no, the, um, the, the, that, that's good coffee. They're good people. They're good. The best, best cigars, but we, we have to get some, we have to get, we're going to be down there again in a few weeks. We got to get, we got to get a box yeah. of cigars. Um, and so the, yeah, he's just good carries. They're good people over there, but, but yeah, but I mean, Clay, Clayburn again, he's a, he's a polarizing fella. He is. And, um, but I mean, he, and he clearly, and the, and the one thing that's, that's definitely true about this is if you read some of the letters that, um, you know, if you read what Daniel Govan wrote, none of the guys wanted to attack Franklin. They just no. thought that was a, that was a fool's fool's run. They wanted to get around their flank, but again, if you're a hood, the clock is ticking. The bridge crossing the Harpeth River is down. Yeah. Schofield is fixing it, and the, he needs to get them before they cross the river, because the Franklin to you know to, to Nashville is not that far. So it's their spot. You have you have Schofield's back against the river. You haven't yeah. you haven't pinned in. It's like Pittsburgh Landing in April sixty two with yeah. Shiloh. You have a chance to beat them. But you have to get through that initial defense. And Hood thought 15,000 men could break the line. And he didn't realize that there was already entrenchments there from previous battles. So it wasn't yeah. like they had to re- – this is not a you know George Green setting up breastwork thing. They're up there. They're entrenched. Optic skies are there. So if you're going to hit that front, you're going to have to hit them hard. It's going to be costly. It just doesn't work. And people don't talk about Franklin's the weather. It was sleeting. It was cold. It was so bad. We're not talking about a warm, sunny day here. We're, we're talking about really bad, cold weather. Yeah. Uh, so you're you're it. It was a it was a hail mary. It was a tough run. Had to do it though. You had to do it, but um, they didn't want to. That's pretty clear. Yeah. No. They they absolutely didn't want to attack. And I you know one thing that it kind of like makes me does make me cringe is when I. You know, people will say like, oh, Franklin was the Pickett's charge of the West. I'm like, no, it's not quite the same thing at all. I think oh, Franklin's a lot worse. A lot it, worse. It's so much worse. You read about the fighting there. It's terrible. Um, and I think, too, what I think what they compared it more to was maybe something like one of the battles in the Atlanta campaign where the Confederates themselves were entrenched and the Union had to attack them. And I think men like Pat Claiborne you know, who had fought at battles like Kennesaw and um, all those ones probably looked and thought, well, shit, we are now in the position that these guys were at this battle where we kicked their ass. There's no way, you know, they got there and they were like, they're entrenched. They're mm-hmm. already entrenched. And yeah, as MJ said, like, you know, Franklin is way worse than Pickett's Charge, not discarding, not disregarding Pickett's Charge. That is still terrible. But Franklin is, you, it, when you study it, you you kind of come away with like, wow, this is, this is not this isn't something that should be compared to Pickett's charge because it's not quite the same thing at all. For one, there was no artillery at Franklin from the uh, Confederate side of it because that had uh, who had that was that S.D. Lee? So that the art- and he was not there <laughs> with the artillery. I mean, there's there's all kinds of freaking problems with this. And, and so, again, you're 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 talking about you're, you're, you're talking about a, 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 a really t- it's a t- it's a tough situation for all of them. There's no question. Yeah. Absolutely, you know, but Franklin, it's 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 really where I mean, again, there's there's not really a movie about it, and that you can't. It's not like you can go visit the field like you can Gettysburg, but um, but it, the, it's 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 bad. I guess the the primary difference is most people would seem to think that post Atlanta, it's all window dressing anyway. Gettysburg, that the it was still in doubt. The game was still yeah. in doubt at that point. I think. You know, Franklin, I, it's just, it's, we said this a million times, it's, it's bloodletting that was unnecessary. It really, yeah. really was. Yeah, where well, you have those, like, six commanders that are there, all the soldiers, um, and just kind of, and then, like, Franklin ends, and what happens, it's like, well, we're going to Nashville. Yeah, the, the, yeah, it's, but the, the, that that was the plan, though. Yeah. And don't forget, I mean, and, you know, if you want, if you really want to read some really miserable soldier experience writing, read some of the, the stories of, uh, you know, some of the Tennessee guys who were retreating back from Nashville, walking in the snow, uphill yeah. both ways, like my mother mm-hmm. used to tell me, but she was back at school, Mary. Mm. These guys had no shoes on, they had no food, their pets' heads are falling off, and everything <laughs> is going wrong with them. But again, that that's that's a really miserable experience for them. And, and the Franklin, you know, the, the Nashville campaign, the oh, Spring Hill, um, Duck River, all that stuff leading up to Nashville, but following back, it's 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 pretty miserable. And they all go back to Tupelo, Mississippi. Go pay yeah. respect to Elvis while you're there, Mary. And then the, the guys from the Army of Tennessee who are still okay to fight, 
they're going to North Carolina fight with Joseph yeah. E. Johnson. So again, all, it's a circular world that go right back to Joseph E. Johnson. Again. Yeah. Joseph E. Johnson starts off commanding in the war and he finishes like he's there at the beginning. He's there at the end. And, you know, the sad thing about when they have to go to North Carolina is they're still caught like Claiborne's division is still called Claiborne's division. Yeah. Same with um, Granberry's Texans. They're still referred to as that, even though these guys are dead. <sighs> but they had to, like, put away their flags because they were being fed into other regiments and other brigades. And that is like that's a very sad part of the story like if you look at something like bentonville you're realizing that johnson is fighting with these um these soldiers that are just they're worn out and you know bentonville not to it's still a battle hardy hardy's boy is killed at bentonville sadly yeah. um but it's still more like a uh, well i guess we it's still what are you doing I just, things fall apart here never mind never mind me i spilled to myself too so i'm not a tough one uh cisco says names tended to stick yeah and i think it was kind of to honor the guys too that had fallen at franklin um it, aq says franklin in my opinion is an overlooked study although historical fiction the widow of the south is a great book about franklin that one has been recommended to us by a few people i need to read it um, we have it here somewhere to, i think it's supposed to be really yeah i think we do um calvin going back up in the comments a little bit says speaking of winchester today is the fir first kernstown anniversary yeah uh, yeah it is a good point i mean in in, in Speaking of for you know what we can do, we can tie it to the Irish because you know whose command the division was James Shields, Mary. Yeah. It was his division of Kernstown. You, you know, um, Nathan Kimball got all the credit, uh, Jeremiah Sullivan, Erastus Taylor, and those guys, Tyler. But but yeah, James Shields was the guy who who ultimately fought that. And when you look at the Battle of Kernstown, we're gonna go to Kernstown pretty soon, I think. I think we're gonna we're gonna yeah. head down there. But um, but that's a great battle too. Is you look at Nathan Kimball, and this is where Richard Garnett, where you know where he gets his court martial from, because because his Stonewall Brigade at the time retreats, and Stonewall doesn't like it. The fact you know Stonewall's way in the back, he's not even up front, and then it has that implication that lead into Gettysburg for Richard Garnett. So talk yeah. about like like the shame, the guilt that that Patrick Claiborne had off Spring Hill, Kernstown's where Garnett gets his guilt. Yeah. Right. And I mean, Stowell gave out court marshals the way Oprah gives out cars. Right. <laughs> court but, marshal for you. Well, you get a court. And he does. He does. <laughs> I mean, all of them. Right. A.P. Hill. <laughs> but but that but this there's a lot of historical parallels. And don't forget the Battle of Kernstown is why, um, you know, is why Irvin McDowell's division gets sent out from the peninsula. Yeah. Which sticks at the McClellan, which allows that whole seven days thing. So they all kind of work together. All oh, these yeah. Battles, it, it's a, it's a constant moving part. It's kind of like we were talking about Stones River in our episode last night. And we did an episode about Stones River a couple of years ago. And um, I think like I remember when we did that, we were talking about how like it's it sometimes comes down to having one more division. That, that could have won you the battle. And we were talking about that when we did our Stones River episode that Bragg had lost, I think, was it a division to go to Vicksburg? And that's kind of right. like, well, you know, this is maybe why Stone because Stones River really, um, it was kind of touch and go for the Union for a little bit. And Sheridan, that is like his, well, one of the his great moments. The Confederacy, the most of the war was playing, was, was Jefferson Davis playing whack-a-mole. It really, really was. Yeah. Because you know, you know, you talk about Lee. He had to fight like hell to keep his own army together because there, there was pressure to send troops from his army in Northern Virginia to Vicksburg. Yeah, he so he and he wanted troops from, um, you know, from the peninsula, but 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 Davis wouldn't let Beauregard go because John Dix was there and they were afraid they were going to leave there the Queen exposed yeah. and they were going to so. He he likes to he wants to get troops over to yeah. help him. He wants to keep his men to go to the Gettysburg campaign, but John Dix is right there. They can and he was never going to attack Richmond because freaking John Dix. But but he's going to slide down the peninsula and he's going to take Richmond. So it's all these moving parts. But but it is interesting when you see how these smaller battles and first Kernstown's a good one where you can look at how these smaller battles have big impacts later. Kernstown. Yeah very much like Perryville in Kentucky, right? Yeah. Is very underrated as turning points of the war. Because you can make the case, okay, Kernstown, it's it's not that big of a deal as far as like the battle goes. It's not an impactful Antietam like thing. But it has so many tremors that led to the bigger things. And in Kernstown, because of Jackson's presence there in the valley, right? 
outside of Winchester, that's going to weaken McClellan, which is going to yeah. hit his reputation. It's going to empower Lee to do the seven days. And it's going to empower then for that, it's going to empower him to do the Maryland campaign. Yeah. And you can make a case that it all goes back to Kernstown. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's 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 a like seven degrees of Kevin Bacon thing in middle. Yeah. But it's kind of true, though, when you look at it and how the impacts of a guy like a Nathan Kimball, who is still the only guy in the Civil War to beat Lee and Jackson in battle. Yep. And no one knows who the hell he is, but but he's no. also the one who tries to stick it to McClellan about the Lost Order 191. Yeah, too. he's he's the reason that uh, that's Stephen Sears's source, which was debunked in real time, but that's never discussed at all. No, but but, but real, but yeah. but you you can when you focus on the big boys, the Antietams, yeah. the Vicksburgs, the Gettysburgs, the Fredericksburgs, there's there's always there's always that like the counting down the rocket where they get to that certain number and they okay we're a go right all these little battles are that countdown leading up to the big yeah. one second winchester is why gettysburg happens in a lot of different reasons yeah. right but if you look at kernstown and you want to look at the butterfly effect of the civil war look at perryville and look at kernstown east and west right yeah um uh, but but that's that's uh but it's true though so i'm glad yeah. someone brought up kernstown I, i'd forgotten that today was kernstown's day because we've been focused on other things but yeah but yeah. it's a very impactful um very impactful battle in the big picture, a small battle. And it's a great battlefield too. Yeah. Um, you, you can go there and you can see that. And it's open to weekends now, which was always because the bat the Kernstown battlefield is a privately owned battlefield. It's not like it's like Elmira the prison. It's not like yeah. a national place. And it's in the middle of a of a development of a house. Yeah, it's well, I've never been there. I've looked at it through the gates because it wasn't open when you and I went there. I know you've been there a couple of times, but apparently this year they're having more regular hours, which is good. So I wonder if they've got like maybe the dude, the old dude that lives there hired some people or something. When when, when we're down when we're down there and I, well, the first time I went, um, it was by just by happenstance they were open. We drove up. We were with our friend Bill, mm -hmm. and we drove in. We were in Winchester, so we drove over to Kernstown, and the gate was open. And we parked and we walked over there, and the, the, the owner was cutting the grass. Yep. Some dude with his friggin' no shirt on with his going. I mean, <laughs> and, and so and so we we get there, and he goes, "Oh, I'm sorry." Uh, the gates closed we're not really whatever i'm like okay no worries and he's like you know what you're here i'll show you around so he gave us a private tour he has a little um uh, like an electric battlefield he's he's building the visitor center is in a garage it's it's just yeah. a small little place but you can you can see the house that's there you can go down to the rock wall where kimball's guys fought um 14 indiana those guys but, but you can go down there but it's a beautiful battlefield but it's one that i'll tell you right now if there's a battlefield that virginia is going to take and build on it's going to be kernstown which is i'm sad. telling you it's because really it's, it, it's not national park service and eventually someone's going to make this owner a, a deal he can't refuse and he's going to yeah. sell it and i'm telling you if you guys want to see kernstown go this summer because I'm telling you, there's so much development all around it, and they just want that ground. It's right outside of Winchester, and it's, unfortunately, it's not going to be around long. But if you um, but if you, if you go, um, if you go, then th that's definitely the time to do it. Yeah, Andrea Quinn, same as me. I assume she's not meaning mowing the ground. The grass topless. I hope that's not what she's talking about, Mary. Jeez. But um, I assume she means Andrea Kernstein. probably just spit out her drink. Hey, been there. <laughs> Good for you. You go, Andrew. You go. But but definitely go visit it because it's definitely a cool battlefield, you know? Oh, yeah. Calvin mentions Kernstown's one of my favorite places to just rock, rock around and explore. AQ yes. said it was closed when I was there, but I pulled a Massachusetts and um, <laughs> drove through, quote unquote, lost. Oh, yeah. Well, you got to, you, you can't, I mean, you, you could, this is big gate. You got to drive this long, windy road, and, and you in this you get there. And so it's you can't just kind of stumble upon it. But there's a big sign that says Kernstown Battlefield. Yeah. But I know I know they're open on the weekends, so you definitely want to uh, now. So definitely yeah. get down there. But I'm telling you, uh, this this like I said before, this is a battlefield. If this battlefield exists in 20 years, I'll be surprised. This is this is the one that's got the bullseye on it as yeah. far as development goes, and the fact that it's not National Park Service ground; it's privately owned. Um. And you know, they, on their website, they have a thing I'm looking at. They said um, you can join the Kernstown Battlefield Association and donate to them. Um, so they've got a, uh, it's like they've got a website about it. I'm no, and we, and we we met the guy, I forget his name, but we, I wasn't thinking of Kernstown today, but I, but I, we met the guy who's very, very cool. He's very proud of the, um, of what he's done. He reminds me a lot of Doug Oaks from Elmira. 
similar Starbucks type of guy, cool guy. Where, where he and his wife are kind of th themselves kind of maintaining that Elmira prison site. And they're trying to build a visitor center and they're taking donations. Um, but this, if you look at the proximity of the Northern Virginia battlefields and you look at the surrounding area to Kernstown, um, it, it's, you can just tell it's, 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 it's not for long unless people develop it or, or donate it. And if they can get the park service, um, and this is this is a site that that Gary and the guys really should get into. Oh yeah, the, 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 the uh, American Battlefield Trust because that's 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 a it's a beautiful pristine battlefield that needs to be preserved because it's like we said before, the Battle of First Kernstown is an important one. Second moment of the Jubilee early is important too, but this one's important because it really helped set up a lot of the stuff that came in the valley, a lot of yeah. the stuff that came in the peninsula, the stuff the Seven Days, and so it has that implication. Right. And also it doesn't make Stonewall look all that great. No. And not not to pig pile on him, but people don't tend to talk about Kernstown or the seven days no. when they talk about Stonewall Jackson. So this is one you got to kind of keep it balanced. So yeah. So hopefully people go visit it because I definitely go visit, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, and I think, you know, with Stonewall, with what we were saying earlier about why can't we give Schofield more credit? The one thing that I like regarding Stonewall with that is, you know, everybody, when they talk about Chancellorsville, they always talk about how the 11th Corps gets routed, blah, blah, blah. They never talk that that's probably Stonewall's greatest moment in the war and that maybe that's more the um, the thing than the 11th Corps not being a great Corps. Um, well, that's what that's we talk about a lot with Frank. It was Spring Hill. It's the same. Yeah, that's what I just said. Yeah, I said that like that's what we were talking about. If you were paying attention. I wasn't. I know. <laughs> Yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't read the comments. I'm too stupid to do more than one thing at one time. So that's the problem. Um, Calvin, they're talking about the amount of time it takes from Gettysburg to Kernstown and people are saying two hours to an hour and a half. Uh, Calvin says a little out of the way, but you could hit, hit Antietam in between Kernstown and Gettysburg. Um, and AQ mentioned Stonewall Confederate Cemetery and Winchester is a must see. Here's what you need to do. Okay. You go to Winchester, you stay at the George Washington hotel. It's right in old town. Stay there for a night. You can go visit. You can go visit all. You can visit Star Fort. You can visit Second Winchester. You can visit Third Winchester. You can go see Stonewall Jackson's headquarters. Uh, you can go to all those bars that night. Get up the next morning. You go to Kernstown. You hit Kernstown, and then you can drive back and you get at Harpers Ferry, Shepherdstown, and Antietam, and then Antietam Brewery. So if you're a real nerd, that's what you do. Yeah. But it's stay. But I would suggest spending a night in Winchester because first of all, Winchester is awesome. It is a great. It's a really cool place. It's a beautiful little place. It's a. It's got a great area with there's all kinds of pubs. In it. It's like Faneuil Hall in Boston if you've been mm -hmm. up there, um, where it's just old timey part of the old Winchester. But there's a lot to see. You can go see the headquarters, of course, where the great Phil Sheridan stayed, Mary, before he yep. went off to Cedar Creek. Right? There's probably a place that uh, Miranda probably is a member of that place. Probably, I'd imagine. Yeah. So but, but you but but you can <laughs> you can go there and you can see a lot of stuff. So. With, Kernstown is not a, a run down, go see it and head back. This is a place you want to spend the night. Yeah. Spend the night, spend the night in Winchester because there's so much around there to see. Um, Star Fort, like I said, is really, really cool. Those forts that uh, that Milroy was trying to defend at the Second yeah. Battle of Winchester. But the Battle of Third Winchester, you can absolutely go see that and walk that. But um, yeah, spend, spend the night there because you need probably a good two days to see that area. Yeah. Um, and you can, if you really, if you really are motivated, you can take a ride down to Front Royal too. And go see the yeah, those, front, those I was just saying, I need to, you need to take me to Front Royal sometime. I haven't been ah, there. Let's see, probably been there. <laughs> no, but the most thing is, is, there's a lot of places to go, but you're kind of going to Kernstown for a day is like going to say, I'm going to go to Gettysburg for the day. Yeah, and, it's, and not, it's not. It's not. It's not the same battle, but there's so much. Unlike Gettysburg, where it's just Gettysburg. Yeah. Um, Kernstown, there's a lot around it that to see it, and you and you know you can you can do all of it in about two days. But the George Washington Hotel is awesome. Stay yeah. there, um, and then you can go, and then because it's walking distance to everything in the town, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, Frank said, please refer to Thomas Jackson as Cleveland of the East. <laughs> yeah, we we joked about that. Yep, yep. Well, it's funny you mentioned this last night, but uh, Claiborne did have a horse called Stonewall. He did. Which he either had a sense of humor or it was a very weird coincidence. <laughs> I, I would, you know, it's funny. I mean, obviously Stonewall is is killed way before before um, Claiborne is, but you always you always wonder like what they thought. Like you imagine you, you can imagine sort of what it must have been like for sitting around the camp 
with um with Hardy and and Claiborne and Govan and Hiram Granberg and those people and, and Lucius Polk and sitting around probably whittling, right? Yeah. You know, talk, talking about what they thought of the guys in the East, you know, yeah. what they thought of Longstreet. Because long, you know what they thought of is Stonewall. Longstreet comes west to the Battle of Chickamauga thinking he's the king of the castle. He's the yeah. man, right? And he does well. But you wonder what you wonder, like in an honest moment, they would sit there and say, Hey, what do you think of this Stonewall guy? What do you think of him? Well, they, I think that, that by that point, Claiborne had, you know, he probably knew his nickname was Stonewall of the West. Of course they did. Absolutely. And they were probably, I can imagine Hardy and Polk and Granbury and Lowry giving them shit for that, being like, huh, yeah. like, you know, or maybe they were like, wow, this is a great honor. Like, we don't know how they felt about them in their day. But the fact that he had a horse called Stonewall, I think kind of speaks to his sense of humor that yeah. he's like, well, call my horse Stonewall yeah no there's no question about it no. and maybe it was um you know and it could have also been in honor of stonewall maybe he got the horse after stonewall died i think stonewall was one of his later horses red pepper was his other horse um both of them were wounded going like he wasn't able to be on either of them um going into franklin um oh yeah Clay, um dh mentions that claiborne was one of shelby foot's favorites i actually read that yesterday that Shelby Foote had said that, you know, someone asked him, well, who's your favorite? And he, you know, rhymes off. He's like, but then there's this guy, Patrick Claiborne, that doesn't get talked about a lot. And he needs to be talked about more. Yeah, no, there's, there's, there's no question about this. I mean, he he, he likes it. We, we have we have fun with old, you know, we have fun with um, Shelby Foote. But, he, you know, he's, he's got his things. But um, what is this? Andrew says this Confederate Cemetery in Winchester is a must see. And she, yeah, she's right. That, that, that's yeah. a good Oh, good to see she has her shirt back on. But if you look at if you go to that cemetery, that's where Turner Ashby is buried. Um, that's where the patents are buried. We went there when, when I, last time I was in Winchester. You didn't go, did you? Did you go to that one? No, it was just me and Bill that time. And we yeah. stayed at the, the hotel. There's a Union Cemetery too, and it's funny. If you go to Stonewall Cemetery, it's a beautiful cemetery, and, and you can you can go there and you can see um, all you can see Ashby. Ashby was killed off. Early, it was before Kernstown, but you can see what you know the, the Patton guys were killed, uh, and they're all buried together. But there's a Union Cemetery there too, and people you could visit that. It's on the other side of the street. There's a street that separates it. Yeah, and there's a bunch of Union dead. There's a really cool Massachusetts monument, but there's a sign there from the 1800s still that has like the like the trespassing signs, and it says, yeah. and I remember this like it was yesterday. It says, if you basically dig up anybody, you're a subject to a fifty dollar fine. That's, That's all it. said. And we would, I think I took a picture. It was, just, it was a, a sign from a million years ago, but it's still there, but it's just kind of funny. Like, um, I don't know why the hell anybody's going to be digging up any bodies, but the, if you, if you, I don't know if that still applies. If you dig up somebody, they're going to 50 bucks. I don't know. Yeah. But, but, but she's right though. It's a great cemetery. And, um, in Turner, Turner Ashby is a guy we, we talked about when we did the current episode. He's another very underrated, um, un underrated guy who got killed early, but it, it was, uh, it, she's right. But Winchester's awesome. Now it's the only one I want to go back to Winchester. Well, we should. Um, Frank said, could you imagine if Jackson's horse was named Ron Ain? Oh, that'd be science. They'd be kind of like, you know, you know, <laughs> if they, could you, I bet today, if the two of them were on social media, they'd have some kind of weird feud. Well, I mean, think maybe about making it. Making these they... underhanded comments about each other. Oh, maybe, maybe yeah, I don't know. Labor are probably like, well, at least I didn't get stuck in a tree. <laughs> that'd be that'd be a fun a fun little thing back and forth going with that. But but no, they definitely. I mean, the Stonewall of the West nickname is definitely an appropriate one. It definitely is. Yeah, and, yeah, and and I see a, why he a, was. It's a it's a compliment to, to you know it's a compliment yeah. to Claiborne is what it is. It's not an insult to. The Jackson, it yeah. just goes because obviously Stonewall was thought of very highly, still is by a lot of people, and so people are going to put that moniker on Claiborne. Um, I don't think the Hood crowd is going to agree with that, but I think for the most part, it's I think it's appropriate. You look at how no. well he fought. You know, no, they, I mean Claiborne is a guy that um, he learned. Like he has really bad days in the Civil War. Um, Shiloh is not a good day for him. Admittedly, it's not a good day for. The confederates overall and um it's not a good day for sherman to begin with yes. but like you know the one thing that claiborne does in these battles in the western theater um and it's not 100 percent known when he did this exactly but he starts looking at kind of the tactical part of it which mm -hmm. you you need to if you're fighting and he's like well this is not napoleonic style warfare anymore if you've been to the western theater you know that it that is pretty much impossible um and he starts seeing it as more of like a bushwhacking thing how the ground is and he recognizes that, you know, he's fought a few battles, Shiloh included and a couple others. And he, 
you know, recognizes like, well, if I had sharpshooters, this is, this is going to be something that I can use to my advantage. I could turn the tide of the battle perhaps with this. So what he does is when they're in like winter quarters one time, is he goes to his officers first, explains the idea, and the officers are like, yeah, we're we're down with this. And then he tells the rank and file, okay, we're going to have um, kind of like a regiment or whatever of or a company of sharpshooters. And why we're doing this is you guys are going to be the ones that are going to go out first. You're going to pick off the artillery guys. You're basically going to be like the front line that we send out first. So this also helps raise morale in the camps mm -hmm. as well. That he has like he says five the five best shooters are gonna from each company are gonna form these sharpshooters, and so they hold contests. Yep. And he creates this that he could because he well, recognizes it's kind of what, like, what Hiram Burdan did similar they they have yeah. a contest for it. but I mean they're gonna have those English Whitworth rifles they're gonna have yeah. a, a really good set of guns and and they do have tryouts and they also incorporate that flag the blue yep. the one you have behind you there the, the yeah. blue with the it looks like the Japanese flag sort of a little bit with the, yeah. with the white thing. Some people call it the flag of Hardy's Corps. Some people call it the flag of Hardy or of Claiborne's division. Well, it was both. Originally, it yep. was Hardy's flag at Shiloh. And then right around the time when that winter quarter is when they were in war traces, when they kind of said, well, we're going to keep this flag for ourselves. We're going to take it. And it became Claiborne's kind of Claiborne's flag. And if you go to Ringgold Gap today, you go to Ringgold Station, they still have that flag flying. I want that flag. Like, I would love to have that flag. Not not that flag. Not take it so down I'm off the flagpole. Pole. That would be. I say, I, I'd pay to watch you shimmy that pole. I don't think you'd make it very far. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I like. I think it's interesting. Like that. You know. And you said this in the episode that you said <laughs> Sherman at some point must have just been dreaming of that flag. No, he he definitely did. I mean, it had it had the um, effect. I mean, it just was because he what was Sherman. For for all the credit he gets for March to the Sea and all that other stuff, which is really his big coup de gras, he, he had he didn't do well against Claiborne. I mean, he no. he got pushed back at Shiloh. Um, he did fight, you know, he fought hard on the counterattack the next day, had a real shitty experience at Tunnel Hill at, at, at Chattanooga, had a really shitty experience at Pickett's Mill, really shitty experience at Kearns at, uh, at Kennesaw. So so whenever whenever Sherman recklessly exposed himself, Mary, yeah, it seemed like it seemed like he was going up against Claiborne's guys and it didn't work out too well for old, old, old Uncle Blingy, right? And so yeah, I mean you you wonder like how much he had Nathan Bedford Forrest and how much he had Patrick Claiborne in his yeah. head because it seemed like he had a difficult time with both of them. But yeah. again, Sherman's Sherman's combat record ain't all that good. It's, it's not. When you look at it, it's not. He's really good on paper, like with like coming up with battle plans. But then when he went to execute, he's kind of like, um, and I kind of wonder how he felt at like, you know, at Pickett's Mill when he gets that, like when Howard's got to write his after action report and Sherman's probably like, so who are you fighting against? Howard's like that Irish dude. Sherman's like shit. Well, I mean that, that that's the thing is you you certainly <laughs> it reminds me of like the old Bill Belichick versus Mike Tomlin Patriot Steeler games where you could take Belichick could have taken a kids from Foxborough High and put them in Pat's uniforms and they'd beat the Steelers with Tomlin. It just it just it was a bad whatever reason it was it was never a good mano a mano matchup and that was Sherman and Claiborne. Yeah, and you know Sherman did get you know he did do he did do better Battle of Atlanta against them when when yeah. McPherson got killed, but for the most part, um, for the most part, Claiborne got the best of him almost every yeah. time. I mean, know? and Claiborne too, and we didn't really mention this in the episode, but the other thing Claiborne had going for him, especially at near the end of his life, was his subordinates. He's got like the A listers of the Army of Tennessee with him. He's got. You know, Lucius Polk, who as much as Lucius's uncle sucked, Lucius Polk make, makes up for that. He's good. He's got Granberry and he's got Lowry and he's got Govan. Yeah. And they, you know, obviously he's friends in, in he's friends with with um with Lucius Polk from back in Helena, just yeah. like his friend with friends with Hinman. And there was a time, you know, when he was still a brigadier, uh speaking of Claiborne, you know, he had the second brigade and it was Hinman who had the first brigade. Yeah, and we didn't we didn't get into too too much of the early part of Chickamauga. 
where Hinman and, you know, and Claiborne kind of, they didn't really do all that great leading up to that. No. And, and, and Claiborne's kind of you know, has a nondescript kind of record at Chickamauga. He, he's there, but it's really Longstreet and Hood who really yeah. pushed the union back. Um, but Hinman, Hinman was, was, he was, he was not the greatest. He wasn't, he wasn't. Hinman, I read a great quote about him that he was always looking for a fight. Well, he, he was he's, perpetually he's, he's angry. Like, he's, he's like five foot, five foot one pro slavery, fire eating type of guy. He was, and he was always looking, always looking for a fight, you know? Um, and you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 that's what he was. And he dragged Claiborne into one when he got in the, that fight with yep. that WD, WD Rice guy in 1856 when the, when the, um, when the whole Congress thing was going down and him was running for Congress and, yep. and lost and was trashing him in the paper. And then next thing you know, <laughs> this guy trashing him in person, <laughs> this guy Rice and three of his brothers jumped them in an alley somewhere and then Claiborne gets shot and it, it ends up in a bad situation. But he, um, uh, he was, he was, you know, he's a hard, hard fight guy, hard, yeah. hard fellow. Yeah, well, the other two, the other hard fighter, and I don't know if I want to call him a hard fighter or not, but uh, was uh, Shot Pouch Walker, who was no fan of Claiborne's, especially after January 2nd, 1864, when the uh, proposal drops to arm the slaves. Shot Um, Pouch, W.T. Walker, he's he's an interesting guy. He gets the nickname Shot Pouch because he kept getting shot. Great nickname. He had the best shockingly, he doesn't make it. The, shockingly, he doesn't make it to, through this. No, he doesn't. Work. But but he he he. There's some great nicknames back in the day. Stonewall, Shot Pouch, Grumble. There was a lot of good nicknames they had back then. Very very lost art from the Civil War is, is the yep. nicknames. But he's a guy who he was a hard slaving secession guy. He would have made Maxie Greg blush. That's how bad he <laughs> yeah. was, right? But he, you know, he's somebody who. He's a he's part of that 18th at the bridge at the Battle of Battle yeah. of Chickamauga, but as soon as as soon as Patrick Claiborne and we haven't really talked about the emancipation thing yet, mm-hmm. right? As soon as he put out that emancipation thing um, in Dalton, Georgia, right? Uh, summer, uh, spring, uh, ah, the winter, winter. of 1863, um, he, where he where Claiborne basically says, you know, we we our three year papers are up, we need men. Grant is is has got men. They're going to beat us with the war of attrition now because Grant's in charge yeah. in that area. We need men. We've got all these these slaves that the the union's taking. Why don't we free our slaves? We'll say you can be free if you join our our, our army and and fight. If independence is really what we want here, this is the way to do it. And um, it, it just needless to say, it, it didn't go too too well. No, uh, especially it, like it, shot pouch. Especially was like. I mean, I find it funny that after that meeting, you know, Johnson is like, this does not leave this room. Um, and Shot Pouch is like, no, it is. And he goes up to Claiborne. He's like, can I have a copy? And Claiborne's like, sure. And uh, Shot Pouch just said, this is sedition and I'm going to send it to Richmond. And Claiborne is just like, good. I, I want the higher ups to see it. I want them to know of my plan. And then Johnson has to tell Shot Pouch again don't send it shot pouch is like completely disobeys the orders gets it to richmond davis gets it and is like well we're hiding this and they don't find it till until a few years after the civil war it doesn't come out it, it's not known at the time because they just completely hide it but then shot pouch doubles down even more and he starts asking people he's like how did you feel about this and i think oh, who is it it's um it's not i think it's hindman who basically tells him to screw off like well, I mean, says, i'm the- not telling you anything the, the the thing about this his uh, Claiborne's emancipation idea, this was not a thing written on a napkin. Hey, let's free the slaves and win the war. Rah rah rah. Let's go. This was a very well thought. We talked before about the the writing of Claiborne, and the one thing he did write well was this emancipation thing. Oh, it yeah. was go. It goes on and on and on. He spent a lot of time on this because he talks about not only do we need the men, but then he talks about the fact that maybe if we do this. This will help get England and France on our side, because if we do this, this might be the thing that gets foreign intervention. He thought about it very, very well. He really, really did. And the ironic thing is 1865, the Confederates kind of come around to this idea, but it's way too late. But um, I mean, I think all along, Davis and Judah Benjamin and and all those guys, they knew that this that might have been a difference. But. It, it, there was that quote out of Richmond. I forget who that might have been Benjamin. I forget who said it, but who said that if we free the slaves, then what are we fighting for? Yeah. It, it, and so it, it, that was the politics part of it. So that's so the politics versus the military 
is always going to be at odds on certain things. Mm. But but Claiborne, it was a pragmatic, it was a numbers, it was a mathematical equation. Yeah. This is what we need to do. But he never realized that this is and it goes to show how tunnel vision Patrick Claiborne was on winning. Yeah. That he, they were going to do whatever it took to win. And if you saw how he fought, it was clear he did not give a shit about the Napoleonic type. He was going to fight oh. the way he was going to fight. Yeah. I mean, if he fought like Albert Pike's, you know, Indian Brigade, just vicious. Yeah, he was you know? a very vicious, like very even after he got promoted and he was supposed to more stay in the back, he still would go out, go out in front. There was a lot of them that did that on both sides. Uh, Frank says plot twist. Walker was so upset because of Clay, uh, Claiborne because he didn't think of the idea first. Oh, there was no way Walker was thinking that idea. Oh, you know that, but he, he certainly didn't. That I mean, would be he, a plot twist. I mean, go, Google a picture of, of shot pouch Walker. Look what he looks like. He doesn't look like the type of guy who's, you're going to go out and get a nice cool glass of lemonade with anytime soon. He was like, he, he was not the, the happiest looking guy in the world. Ooh, sitting for that, no, sit, just, imagine just, sitting for that picture. Imagine it was like, geez, take the picture and get this guy the hell out of here. My God, he's wow, scared of children. Um, you know, I'm just looking <laughs> at him now. <laughs> Holy. Yeah, he's not. He's not a not a happy looking guy. No, no. Comment. Then again, if you nickname Shot Pouch, how much how, how much fun are you going to be around anyway? You know, I'd be angry too if I had been shot that much. Yeah, I tried to put a smile on him. And I couldn't do it. It just can't be really? done. Really? It just, it just doesn't, doesn't line up right. It looks. It looks. Well, the it, eyes it, are just. Angry. Yeah, it's, 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 he's he's not a bad guy. You know. Now everybody's going to be all of a sudden on Google. The algorithm is going to be shot pouch walker. And you got all kinds of shot pouch walker stuff now, but but he's you know he's a hard fighting dude. No no question about it. He doesn't get a lot of credit for that for the September eighteenth attack at the first day of Chickamauga mm -hmm. against uh, against Minty and Gene Wilder, Gene. right? <laughs> or on the bridges, but but he's you know again he's a guy who got his nickname because he kept getting filled with lead. Yep. You know. Yep. Uh, Frank said in the episode. <laughs> You need to read some poems that Patrick Claiborne wrote. Oh, they're terrible. No, he, he was he was not. A, he was a he was a interesting guy. Good at history. Good at good at math. And but he hated the four languages. But I he liked to, I he did too. To read, like though. yeah. Oh, he loved to read. He loved that was his that was his thing to do when he was in the British Army. Um, and when he lived in Helena, like he formed kind of what would be considered today a book club. Um, when he was in Helena, he was part of the literary society. Yeah. So it's like a book club. So they're sitting around drinking their tea, talking about books, probably. Today we're talking about chapter two. I can only of imagine this, sitting there. Yeah, of this rom-com we're reading right now. <laughs> Sense and Sensibility. Okay. <laughs> okay, today today we're talking about It's Me, Margaret. <laughs> I don't so think I understand what this one's about. Do we want to read Jane Eyre, or one of the Bronte sisters next time, Hinman? It absolutely you know reading some of that stuff but but no but he's but he's he's an interesting guy and, and and he's a guy you can look back and you can see by his you know that the, where they say that things that happen in your early days set the foundation for your life and yeah. it becomes who you are it's not exactly rocket science but that's true but patrick claiborne you can look back in his childhood you can look at how he was and you can clearly see the events that affected him obviously he, he i mean he was 18 months when his mother died obviously he didn't yeah. remember her um, you know, his, his a Protestant Scott is going to raise him when his father dies when he's around 15. That's that really, really affects what, him. that, that, that affects him badly. And they still have money. It's not like they were destitute. And he, when he, but when he couldn't get into that school and he felt that he was shaming his father's memory and the Claiborne yeah. name, that's what he really changes. He goes to the military. He loves the military. He learns the foundations. He loves being a soldier. He knows basically that if he tells him he's a Claiborne, he's going to be an officer, and he keeps it quiet. He enlists as a private, um, and he, he rises through the ranks in the Confederate Army very quickly. Jefferson yeah. Davis personally promotes him to division. Yeah, you know William Hardy gives him his for his star, gives him his brigadier star uh, very quickly. He ends up over in the the, the Kentuckys, Richmond and, and uh, Perryville, yeah. basically running his own running his own army for a short period of time. Oh, Richmond is his probably one of his. You know, that's kind of the moment where he starts kind of people start seeing who he is. Um, and I think it's Shiloh probably because Shiloh. Yeah. I mean, you think about it. He's he's attacking on the left. He's the first, and he's always the first guy, right? Yeah. He, he's attacking Sherman's guys, and he basically. Astro Glide Sherman pushes him all the way back, basically towards Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Landing, Tennessee River, and and then he's fighting on the way out to the next day. And he's holding that line. They fall back to Corinth. 
he's the guy who has to be the speed bump to slow the union down from yep. so that so the army can escape out of Corinth. And so he repeats that again in Ringgold Gap. Uh, and he's getting and he's getting wounded all the way along the way. He gets shot in the face, right? At Richmond. It, it, yep. Richmond loses his teeth. He's back a month later. How many people are going to get shot in the face at work tomorrow and they're going to go back on Tuesday? Yeah, right? they're not. And I he also it. had trouble speaking after that, too. Like, apparently he spoke. Gee, I wonder with, why. Well, I yeah. The whole side of his face. But he spoke with a lisp, apparently, yeah. I think is how it would translate today. Um, and he he would try. He also tried to hide his accent, too. But then sometimes it would still come out a little. This, like, Irish brogue that he had. But he's yeah. described as not having it as strong as some of the other, like, you know, the Irish we talked about last last episode in the Irish Brigade, much stronger Irish accents. Uh, Frank mentions this was definitely one of my favorite episodes. I identify a lot with Claiborne, shy, introverted and nerdy. <laughs> oh, well, appreciate well, it. Thank you, Frank. I mean, he, he was. And the thing about him was uh, for people, he was a type of guy you met for the first time in you come away by going, oh, that guy's kind of a dick. You just, yeah. he, he kept to his aloof, but he, but once you got to know him, and there's that great story of that time when when Hardy's riding around, and this is out of when they're back in War Trace, and he's riding around, and they apparently meet a couple, meet some women on the road. Yeah. And Hardy is being Hardy, he's always dressed in the nines. And then there's there's Patrick Claiborne, looks like Joe Shit the Bagman. You know, he's wearing all these rags. And and then he is so Joe embarrassed by he's so embarrassed, he rides back to camp. Yeah. And he's basically hiding in camp because he knows Hardy's going to be mad at him yep. for, for basically Hancock blocking him. That's kind of how he saw it. <laughs> he comes back and, you know, and then Claiborne, Haber, Haber, Hardy rides back into camp and says, where's my wild Irish general? And he's yelling, but he's not mad. He's kind of busting his balls. And yep. Dr. Johnson, the division surgeon is there going, he's right here. Here he is. Yeah. And Claiborne's trying to fight back laughter, and he's sitting there, and they have this conversation about, you know, how they're how sheep are reared in Ireland, and all these yep. weird conversations that are being said. To and, and Claiborne's holding his, trying not to laugh as hard yep. as he can, and he's just busting his balls over and over and over again. But they had a good relationship, Hardy and Claiborne, to the point that when Hardy gets married in sixty, you know, like yep. next year 64 Clay, yeah Clay, Clayburn so Clayburn's the best man at Hinman's wedding and Hardy's wedding yeah which is pretty cool <laughs> MJ said did someone say Hancock and I'm like it's your bat signal yeah exactly but that's but that's the truth though and then he, of course he goes to Hardy's wedding he's going to meet Sue Tarleton and he's going to fall yep. head over heels and, and he's going to and then that whole sad tragedy is going to go but yeah he's an interesting very interesting personality and I think he, I think he always was very focused on his his family's lineage and trying to do well by his family. Yeah. But he was definitely socially awkward, and that's why he liked Helena so much, is he was accepted there. Oh, I think it's a, it's kind of like nobody knows me here. I can be accepted. You know, he opens that store with with Nash, and they're very successful. Um, he's very enthusiastic about it. Like he goes like his first day on the job, he reorganizes the entire store. And I kept like thinking like, oh my God, this is like Rose Apothecary in uh, Schitt's Creek. And he's like, yeah. David. and he's like, David, like Claiborne mm -hmm. is David in this regard. Like he's just making everything look nice. <laughs> oh, he <laughs> doesn't. And you think about it. If you're, if you're a foreign guy like Claiborne is, and, and he had, he came from privilege. So and he had, he was educated. He could read, he could write. He wasn't like, a lot of the, the Northern Irish, um, the Irish Catholic Irish, but you know, he ends up joining the Lafayette Lodge, the, the Freemason yep. Lodge, and a year later, he's the master of the lodge, which is which it, it which is, says a lot, right? That seems like a lot. Right. That seems like really quick. Yeah, well, it, it it is. It certainly is. It's 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 you know, it's unheard of, really. But but and then he gets they pick him to be a royal arch, which is which. It, it's a very difficult degree to be picked for and to go through and pass and move on from. And he not, not only does do they pick him for this degree and he gets through it is Albert Pike is there and he's the one who kind of presides over it, wow. which is, which is, which is big time. I mean, that, that's, that's a, that's a big coup. Albert, if you're a Freemason, you know who Albert Pike is. You think more of the Scottish right Freemasonry than you do the civil war stuff that, but yeah. that's how big he was. But to go from in four years, basically being in the British Army, paying for your to get out of it, to be to be who he was in Helena, it, it says a lot of how he was, especially 
if you're not an outgoing introvert, uh, an extrovert type of guy, yeah. you're who really em- pushes his record like the Chamberlains of the world did. Yeah. He just found his niche and embraced it. Mm-hmm. He was a type of guy who could be friendly with the rich or the poor. He was, yeah. he was, he was like, you know, he, he was, he was everybody. He was the man about town and, and, and yeah. it really helped him when he got the yell rifles. Again, when he joins that Yell Rifles, he creates the company, but he's a private. He puts himself as a private. He doesn't want to be the commander, but they yeah. say, no, 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 you're going to be the commander of this. And so when they get incorporated into the first Arkansas, which turns into the 15th Arkansas, he gets made colonel. Yeah. Right off the bat, Hardif takes a shine to him, likes him. Now he's a brigade guy pretty soon later. He gets a star. And then he's made a division by the president. He's like the Confederate Forrest Gump. Everything he does is right. It, it, <laughs> yeah. it, he's awkward and weird, but everything is successful. It's exactly awkward. who was – that's who he is. So that's yeah. exact pop culture parallel. Yeah. Is that's who he was. Yeah, and it's re- he's he's a really cool study. Highly recommend reading um, Simon's book, Stonewall of the West. That is yeah. probably – I know there's a couple other biographies out there. The other one that I read too um, was I read part of a collection of essays, um, which is called A Meteor Shining Brightly. And it's just essays collected about Pat Claiborne. And it details every aspect of his life, including like from his early days, like his childhood and all that. It's really interesting. Um, That's how I found out he was called Ron Ain uh, by his family. That's how they addressed him. He was not called Patrick. And I didn't know that. And I thought I had discovered something really cool. And then you were like, I already know that. Oh, I mean, it's whatever. (laughs) But, yeah, but, but, but that the meteor shining brightly is a great i need to i want to get it because i managed to find a free copy and you know who and you know who made that quote about him it was robert e lee robert e lee said he's a meteor shining right that was robert yeah. e lee's quote but people look at claiborne and they they want him so badly to be born on saint patty's day yeah and and because and that just and his wouldn't name, work because he's right, not catholic but, and, and, right and his name is patrick so they're trying to tie him together like he's you know that he's this classic irish and he was anything but that. And, and we talked about in the episode, I think, yeah, we did, about the Anglo-Irish in Ireland yeah. versus the Ulster, the Ulster Scots and the Ca- Irish Catholic. There, there are three distinct social classes at the time in Ireland. And he was you know, the Duke of Wellington, I mentioned in the episode. People associate him uh, with British. He's from Dublin. Bram yeah. Stoker. People associate him with England. He's from Dublin. He's British. Yeah. They're part of the Anglo-Irish who consider themselves that British aristocracy in Ireland. This is not the this is not the, the Irish Catholic rural people. This is not who they yeah. are. They associate themselves more with British than they do with Ireland. And um, maybe that's why he didn't catch a lot of the Irish, anti-Irish immigrant stuff. Even though he was from Ireland, he was more of a associated with the british but um but he's completely different so the people who would put him with the the shamrock and the and all this stuff it's it's really it's 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 just not true yeah, he's not like he's not, not he's not like that and he wanted to be an american that was his thing and he wrote his mother isabella hung back in ireland i think for a little bit before she immigrated over but she he wrote her a letter and said regarding like the their younger like his youngest half brother saying like you need to integrate him into being American and he needs to be proud to call this place home, you know? Um, and it's really like, it's really interesting how he's like, this is my home now. I'm an American. Um, oh, Frank said, cannot stress enough. I definitely recommend the Claiborne graphic novel fictional story, mm-hmm. kind of lost cause, but still entertaining. It is. It's really, it, it, it does nail a lot of the history too. And the artwork is amazing in it. Yeah. I mean, th- th- we have it here somewhere around here. We have it, but it's, okay, so, um, but it's, uh, it's got some bad stuff. I mean, it has that picture of, of John Bell Hood basically getting banged up on Laundrum, <laughs> Laundrum yeah. right at the back. Like he was, I mean, that, that's just not true. I mean, you can, have, you can have all your fun with who you want, but he he was clearly off the off the freaking drugs at that point. Yeah. But but it, it's, it, you know what it does capture well is a story of when Sue Tarleton found out that Patrick was killed. Yeah. She found out about it from the, the newspaper boy going extra, extra, read all about it. Patrick yeah. Claiborne got killed and she's in the garden. You know, and she that's how she finds out about it by the paper boy. I don't think she tipped him that day. I wouldn't. No. <laughs> oh, Bjorn's on here. He said, nerd, so hey, many Bjorn. fun things to learn about Pat Claiborne in Ireland. Yeah, there's so there's so many things about it. And, and it seems like it's such a, you know, it's such an easy subject. He's an Irish guy. He's fleeing the oppression. He's he's but that's not who he was. And Ireland was a very different country than than 
then the the Irish Brigade, the 69th, the 63rd, the 88th, the 116th PA, and the 28th Mass. That's not that's not yeah. who these guys. That's not who Patrick Claiborne was. He wasn't the 24th Georgia. He was a guy who fought um, on a much different mind level than oh. these guys. He had no intention of learning learning experience to go back and fight England because he was England. Oh yeah, exactly. No. Yeah, he had no. He was not going to go back. America was his home. Um. So Bjorn says, I don't need to recommend Craig Simon's book to you. I know you love that book. Yes, we do. Um, Ab- so Bjorn works at Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago, which is really awesome store. I'm going to post a link to their web. This is a link to their website. So check it out. They've got all their stuff that they have. I think they have it pretty much posted on their website as well. But they have a great Facebook page, too, where they do really awesome Facebook lives with authors. Um, so definitely check them out. But yeah, Simon's book, and I know there's a meteor shining brightly. And then there's, I know Frank had he mentioned last week the other there's another book about Claiborne too, um, which was written um in the 60s or 70s, I think. No, we had Craig on in the book club a few months ago to talk about that book. And 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 you know, he's a guy who taught at the Naval Academy. This is a yeah. pretty legitimate guy. I don't know how he's a cool. Guy. I heard so many, there were so many positive things said about him. Like yeah. I posted the book the other day and so people were like, Craig Simons is off. Like he's such a good guy. And he is, he's. And he is. And it's funny because and he's not an arrogant guy for a guy, uh, you know, who, who was a big history professor at West, at uh, Annapolis. I'm saying I was at West Point. Right? My ass yeah. kicked. I said that cool. to him. Right. And so he ends up um, basically assigning a, st- an, an, um, an assignment to his students. And one of his students submits a paper on this Patrick Claiborne guy. Who he had ever heard of, he read it, became so impressed by it that he wrote a book about it. That's how impactful, you know, and how good it was. He didn't, and yeah. he was very clear that that's where he got the idea from from one of his students. So he gave credit to the kid. Uh, but he his 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 book is is the gold standard read on Patrick Claiborne. It's yeah. not even close. I mean, I don't think there are a hell of a lot of books on Claiborne, admittedly, but I think no. that if you're going to read a book on Claiborne. Um, contact Bjorn. He'll get, I'm sure he'll get you, get you a copy yeah, of it. He's got, he's probably got, he's probably got a copy signed by two Bjorn from Patrick Claiborne, probably it's stuff he pulls <laughs> off. I don't know how they guess this stuff, he's, but he's, he's, he's got some awesome stuff. Man. I, I love, we're going to go to Chicago soon to go visit Bjorn. You, yeah. you got to see, you got to go see this place. I, I've been there and you haven't. I, know. Ha, 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 I ha, saw ha. it virtually. And Frank's been there too. So that's, that's yeah. another one. It's you know. pretty cool. Yeah. If you find yourself in Chicago, um, get to Abraham Lincoln bookshop. Um, so the other book that Frank said is um, Con- Patrick Claiborne, Confederate General by Howell and Elizabeth Perdue from 1973 is the other other one. There, 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 there are obviously books about it, but I think if you're going to if you're going to read a book, if you're going to read a book, then that's the one to read. I mean, yes, that's just, yeah, you, you can yes, you Simon, can drill yeah. you 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 can re- drill down. You can get more books on it, but but that's a good you know a place good to start. Three, a good right, a good 360 view on Claiborne. It's very um, balanced. Yeah, um, he said, um, so Bjorn mentions William Burton's Melting Pot Soldiers is a good work on ethnicity in the Union Army. One of Burton's observations is that the vast majority of Irish um, joined non, I'm waiting for him to finish the sentence. <laughs> there, but, but yeah, so there's that one there, William Burton's Melting Pot of Soldiers. And then that's mm-hmm. on ethnicity in the Union Army. Oh, that the vast majority of Irish joined non-Irish regiments. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the thing too. Is he, as, as much as we love the Irish Brigade and Michael Corcoran and those guys, I mean, they they were dotted through there. But they, but I guess the romanticism of all these Irish guys joining the 69th New York and then expanding out, it, it tells a great melting potish type story. Um, but again, the, the dark side of that whole thing is they weren't treated very well, even by Washington. They, no. they weren't, um, and they had a real tough time recruiting because. It was mostly word of mouth recruiting. Yeah. And after the after the 69th New York, they they got smashed at the first battle of Shiloh, and they they there's that story where they took their shirts off because it was hot. Probably saw Andrea probably, and they attacked and they got pushed back at the. So Hill you mean House. first bull run? First, forget what I say. First Manassas. First Shiloh. Shiloh. Oh, first Manassas, I mean. So that, but, but, oh God, I hope there was the second Shiloh. Shiloh. The second Shiloh was probably coming. Second Shiloh. Was no, first Manassas. But but they went back after that battle because it was you know thirty day papers, whatever. And they're like, "Don't sign up for these guys. You don't. You don't. You, they're going to treat you like dogs." And so when when they go to re, when Marv specifically goes to recruit, they're like, "Nope, we ain't going to do it." You know. And so they had a real tough time recruiting. So 
so and then his you know Mara's biggest pet peeve was was getting around this 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 idea and so he did they did, did get other regiments they did get other men but you saw their brigade fall from 4000 to 300 in a year yeah because of attrition and the fact they couldn't recruit and the fact that Washington and Stanton who had a beard by the way Mary yeah and Henry and Henry <laughs> Halleck didn't give a fiddler's f less about them for the most part and the whole James Shield story and all that stuff um and so it's uh there's a there's a there's a lot to it than than this idea of these guys coming over here to fight and they fought hard and they certainly did, but they had one arm tied behind their back from from the capital and, and that that's the sad truth about it. Yeah, AQ's dropping off. She said just put her top back. <laughs> yeah, because that's a reverse Porky Pig situation. She probably has going right there, but it's okay. <laughs> Um, uh, Ben says he's as always on late. Well, don't worry about it, Ben. Ben from Texas is on here too. Yeah, no question, no question about that. But no, but but it's it's a great study, and I think as as people study the Irish Brigade, you know, obviously in in March people tend to focus a little bit more of them, especially social media. Um, You you can really get into maybe some of the misconceptions. Do you realize how hard it must have been for the Irish Brigade to go back to New York City to fight the draft riots against their own people? How that must have been. You know? Oh, that like that would have just been no thanks. Um, Frank's got a question. He's going to Gettysburg and Antietam in a couple of weeks, and he's like, anyone ever do an Antietam battlefield guide tour? Well, let me tell you, because you're asking the right person, okay? Yeah. Um, one of our friends, Tom McMillan, does tours at Antietam. He's the writer of the Armistead book with uh, with Hancock, and I would suggest definitely try to reach out to him, Frank. Because he's part, he's a volunteer, and and team is a little different from Gettysburg. You don't where they don't don't have this big elaborate test set up, and everybody gets all excited about it. It's a little bit different. You can sign up, and you can take classes, and you and you can basically be a volunteer guide and teach them. It's a really yeah. good program. Um, but Tom does it. Uh, he's one of the folks who does it, and he's he has he's a really really good solid knowledge of Antietam. So yeah, um, I would reach out if you know him. If you don't, we can put you in touch with him. But certainly, uh, I'm sure he'll 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 do it. But uh, definitely use Tom. But that's what I would suggest. Yeah, and, and his wife does it too. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yep. I mean, but uh, but you can. But that's what I would say. It's a little bit different from the Gettysburgs of the world, which they they do what, much more bells and whistles to their program. But 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 that's what I would suggest you do. Definitely yeah, reach out definitely. Yeah, definitely get get a tour with him. Where I mean, any of them would be great. But yeah, they do ha- they do have tours. Highly recommend doing that. Um, MJ asks, isn't there an essay book on Claiborne? Yes, and I posted it in the chat. It's called A Meteor Shining Brightly. Yep. You can get parts of it for free on Google Books. That's how I read some of the chapters, um, but it's not. And I wish, like, I'm kicking myself. They had it at Pickett's Mill Battlefield, and I did not buy it when we were there. And I so, I regret, I, that was like the Monocacy hoodie for me. I've regretted that ever since. Oh, really? I thought we got a book we were at Pickett's Mill, didn't we? Nope. Remember, I was thinking about buying it. And then we were like, I, I remember looking at the books with you when you were looking through some of the books, but I, I, I thought, um. I don't know. I'm sure you're right. You remember this up better than we do, you know? Yep. Um, Ambrose has a question. He said, were the Irish who were killed treated differently than their American counterparts when they were killed? So was there like difference in like how they not buried really. them or whatever? The, no, not really. They took, they took care, they took care of themselves for the most part, but there was yeah. really, there's, there's no difference. I mean, you look at the battle of you know, Fredericksburg, for example, you had Irish and Irish crime at the wall of the sunken road, but yep. no, not really. Not really. Irish on Irish crime. <laughs> well, I mean, you did, you did. But they were they were they were buried and you know there was there was some who were who were Freemasons they got Freemason funerals there were some that were just buried there but there was, there was not really not really I mean yeah. they, they didn't the hardest part about it was was the the Irish Brigade the the Northern Irish Brigade specifically they were the ones who t- primarily were the they were the ones a lot of cases that were in the front they were set up front and so they had high high casualties all the way through and the, the other thing too is they fought with smooth bores. So when you look at Antietam, for example, they're attacking the sunken road. Yeah, these smooth bores are only accurate for like fifty or so yards, versus the rifle muskets the Rebs had are accurate for hundreds of yards. So they could they had to get in their faces to be successful, and they got picked off left and right. There's a reason why those battle flags got ripped up, and they had to use a, the the, um, the boxwood sprigs in their hats because they they got shot up so bad their flags got destroyed. Um, so that 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 that, that was a tough. Tough spot. And as much as people like to talk about the Battle of Gettysburg with um, 
with the Irish Brigade, they were a brigade name only at that point. We said yeah. before, the 69th and 63rd had two companies each. The 116th only had four companies. So And, and they, they were in and out of there. 20 minutes is all they fought. They were gone. Patrick Kelly yeah. was in and out. They were talking about an Irish goodbye, Mary. They were in and out. The Irish goodbye. <laughs> You know? I'm just posting a link to some of the chapters to Meteor Shining Brightly, um, which is available on Google Books, but highly recommend getting a copy of that. Um, it's kind of a long link, but there it is. There's some, yeah, they're very like, they're not full chapters or anything, but you can get a sense. How, like, how much was the book at Pickett's Mill? Do you remember? I think it was like maybe $25 or $30. I don't know why oh. I didn't buy it. It was like, it's become like my Monocacy hoodie now. Regret yeah, it. Well as we drove away right by from you i don't know if you know this but there is a there is something called the internet there you can probably go on the pickets bill site and probably buy it probably probably should do that yeah but it's pretty good though yeah but but you know claiborne is a claiborne is a, is a, is a great study he, he just is and he, he he draws a real contrast between michael corcoran very yeah. it's, it's, it's very different ask, irish well di- different irish different religions different dreams yeah, different, different dreams. dreams. Yeah, that's but exactly. That, it. <laughs> and, you know, well, even you know, speaking of that, you know who met Patrick Claiborne Mayor was the great Arthur Freeman. Yeah, he did. Yeah, and he talks he about it in his diary too. He, he, he talks about if you look at the uh, the three days, the three months in the Southern States by Freeman, the diary he has, he talks about his his experience with Claiborne and how impressed he was, and he he says specifically how much experience that clearly he Claiborne was showing then when he went from the 41st regiment of foot in England, he, he, he yeah. could tell by the way he drilled his men because he was there in camp that he drilled them the way the British drilled. And he, it was yeah. a very distinct, much harder drilling that he clearly he says he clearly learned from the Brits. So he, yeah. he, he definitely, uh, definitely appreciated Claiborne. But Claiborne was definitely loved by his men. All that he was very, like he said, he made them work hard, but you know, some, there's one story I didn't tell it last night um, in the episode, but there was one where he actually came some of the men had slaughtered like a cow or something they found and that was like you're not supposed to do that and then all of a sudden Claiborne's like walking towards them and of course the men are all like yikes and then you know is he gonna find out we slaughtered this cow and he's like can I join you guys and of course they're like sure and they're like do you want some beef and Claiborne's like yep well, then the stories too. They got the cow or anything. He was. I mean, there are like, stories too really where, where Claiborne will tell his men, you know, don't tear down fence rails. Don't just. And of course, they did it for firewood, and so he he would make them carry the fence rails around in circles, and just. I mean, he he would do it, but they, I mean, he had a fun side. He was loved by his men. There was this big snowball, well, snowball fight, fight they fight had where they um, captured him. Oh, some and, and then someone said, like, apparently in the one on the thirty first March, someone said, make him carry a fence rail. Yeah, that was the penalty with carrying fence rails. That was the big penalty for Claiborne. I mean, um, but so there was, the, so you can see that, but that, but that's who he was. He was, you know, he was very much, like we said before, going back to his days in Helena, he had that strange ability to be liked by everybody. Yeah. Whether by rich or poor, he, he treated, he treated people hard, but I think he treated people fairly. And I think, and I think a lot of it too comes from William Hardy. He got lucky and had a good good commander of a very and that goes back to a lot where you you have like a really good commander you're going to be good yourself and your commander is going to recognize your talents and obviously hardy recognized his talents the same way that claiborne is going to recognize the talents of lucius polk of hiram granberry of lowry of liddell of all those guys well, the other thing yeah, I was going hardy's biggest things at the beginning was he kept his men fed and kept his men yep. supplied and so he always made sure that the claimer, the best of his ability, that he would try to do the same thing and then drill him hard as well. Yeah. Um, and, They're- you know, Hardy, Hardy was, he was, a you know, he, I know he's, he's another polarizing guy. Some, either you love him or you hate him. Yeah. There's um, some that just like, there's a certain crowd that says he's overrated, especially when it comes like that he should have taken over instead of hood. And I think he should have, but he was like, Nope, I don't want anything to do with that. No, I mean, overrated is, is the eye of the beholder. I mean, theoretically, everybody's overrated. Anybody yeah. who's popular is overrated because I mean, because just, just by the definition of the word doesn't mean doesn't mean you think they suck. It just means that, that yeah. maybe they there are other people who he gets more credit than other people for for different reasons because of publicity. William Hardy again, he was a star in the, in the U.S. Army before the war. He wrote the, yep. the book on on training. He did all that stuff, and so he was he was a known guy. Um, 
treated his men well for the most part, had some success. He, you know, he had his own issues too. He loved the ladies and he loved to run around and all yeah. that stuff, like a lot of guys. But I mean, a lot of the guys, at Allegheny Johnson, old clubby, is a guy who never wore pants, you know. <laughs> Neither did Earl Van Dorn. Right. And so they 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 all have their flaws. I mean, look, you know, Dan Sickles comes to mind. A lot of these guys are all being adorable, like you said. But it, but he was someone, Hardy, who who treated his men well. And by he so if you're Claiborne, you're learning from your boss, which like most people do, plus your own background you have of drilling. Yep. He was someone who who the men really appreciate, you know, working for. And it, it doesn't it doesn't mean that he was without his flaws. I mean, Claiborne had his issues. Of course they all yeah. did. Clay, and, yeah, Claiborne and, had bad days in the Civil War, the same that Stonewall Jackson did. It's it, just like, you know, I'm not a huge uh, fan at all of Stonewall Jackson, but Stonewall Jackson was good. He's really no, he was, but I think the, I think, though, the, I think the Claiborne thing is you, you could see Claiborne's personality changing as the war went on after Ringgold Gap. And when they went into the summer of, of, of the winter of 63, he clearly knew he's like, you know something? I, I've got a lot of cachet, you know, Richmond loves me. Um, you know, I'm doing well, well fighting. My star is as bright as it's ever going to be. So that's what he did as emancipation thing. So he, he did, he did maybe overstep a little bit base or he never would have done that in 1862 but then when he felt that he was probably at the pinnacle of his popularity in the army that's when he did it so he definitely had his he definitely had some issues no question oh, yeah. you know um, grant is on here said jefferson c davis had a few faults <laughs> like murder well, Je- <laughs> well yeah well jefferson c-, jefferson c davis is the guy who fought claiborne at stones river speaking yep. of uh, back of the Hell's Half Acre, so they had some history with those two too. But yeah, Jefferson C. Davis, he was, you know, he had, he certainly had his issues, but, but, but yeah, but, but these guys all connect in different places on, di- on different different experiences, you know. But yeah. when he got when he when Jefferson Davis got Claiborne, it was it was July, I mean uh, December thirty first, eighteen sixty two, Battle of Stones yeah. River, and that was again another situation where it was um, it was absolutely fighting like fighting like devils. That's that's what yeah. he, that's what Davis got. Yep. Yeah. Jefferson C. Davis had more issues than Vogue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and speaking of back to Hardy, Bjorn recommends uh, Nathaniel C. Hughes, um, William J. Hardy, Old Reliable from 1965 is probably still the best Hardy bio, in his opinion. And that's the thing is some of these guys have not had a bio in a long time. Howard's another one that has not had a bio since the 60s either. Um, but that one about Hardy, like I'd love to read that one. No, he's an interesting guy. He's one of those people who who people know who he is, but either just don't have the time or the desire. He, he doesn't have that the sexiness that Stonewall Jackson has, or the or the sexiness of William Sherman has. He just he's just you know that that's a, a, a level of guy. But again, when you're looking at a pure military guy who had a little bit of flash to him, a little bit of substance, a little bit of personality, Hardy's a good one. He's a good yeah. one to study. Yeah, he's he's at West Point, I think, when secession starts to happen and and all that. And I think he he does have a he and Howard are very good friends and they have a conversation. And Hardy basically tells Howard, I'm I'm going to fight for the South if there's a war. And that had to be like Howard had a lot of friends who did fight for the South. And I can't imagine like I would imagine that's kind of hard to reconcile, but he doesn't judge them for it. Kind of like after the war, they he's also very good friends with um sd lee mm-hmm. you know they remain they kind of, well sd lee and him had a falling out after the war but they reconciled a couple of years before sd lee passed away but at the battle of um bentonville um there's a courier that comes through with a message for howard from the confederate side and it's to tell him specifically that hardy's son had been killed in the battle and um howard had been helping him out with math at west point yeah no, it definitely is. And um, Jefferson C. Davis. See, he's, he's another one you could read. I mean, I mean, I would like, admittedly, I would like to read a biography about him, but that guy just has, so, there's so much going on. Well, you you killed, you know, Bull Sumner, right? Or and, Nelson. You know, Nelson, Bull Sumner. Bull, Bull, uh, Bull Nelson. The thing about him, though, is Nelson's got a history with Claiborne, too, because he's mm-hmm. the one who got his ass kicked at Richmond. Yeah. You know, by by Claiborne. So they yeah. all they all they all dealt with Claiborne at some point. They all did that. That's why when you look at some of these these battles, uh, Stonewall Jackson, for example, most of his battles were against. You know, think about it. He fought against Nathaniel Banks. Yeah, 
from the Great Wall of Fan Mass. He fought obviously against against um, against Hooker, uh, but he but 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 Claiborne got all of him. Claiborne fought Sherman twice directly, fought Hooker once directly. Yeah, I mean the, the big boys. And then when you look into the, some of the subordinates, he you know he ran into Don Carlos Buell a couple times. So he's he fought. A, a lot of the best union guys, and for the most part, came out of it with a win. For the yeah. most part, he did. Yeah, and um, Ob Orn mentions Nate Hughes is the biographer of General Reb as well. So there is a Jefferson C. biography about that too. No, definitely. Well, we're going to jump off pretty soon. Yeah. I know you got some stuff to do. Um, some great, great day for you into college hockey today. Today is a great day for that. Yeah. So we do have one question before we jump off. From okay. Grant asked it said, "What do you think Claiborne's role would have been after the war if he had lived?" Well, we talk about that a little bit. I think, honestly, my personal opinion, again, opinion, not fact, I think he goes back to Arkansas and becomes an attorney and spends the rest of his life in Helena. I, I don't That's I don't true. think, well, so I don't think, honestly, I think when the war ends, I think he, just by looking at how he fought and his mentality and personality, I think he would have felt my job was for Southern independence. I'm going to fight it on a win or I'm going to lose or I'm, and then when it's all said and done, my job is done. I'm going to go home. Mm-hmm. I think I don't think he I don't think he cared about the politics, the big picture politics. He was such a local guy. Yeah, he cared about that's, his that's a good Arkansas point. and Helen. I think he would have gone back. I think he might have been a, the governor of Arkansas. He might have been a, the mayor of Helena. I that's think that's what whatever, I was thinking today. Right? I think he might have been the mayor eventually. I mean, he you know he might have been like you know like like Wilder in Chattanooga. He might have just gone back home and just stayed local and just I, he didn't strike me as a guy who would have been like Longstreet or John Brown Gordon, a big national big picture reconciliation reconstruction guy. I think he goes home and I think he basically stays home. Yeah. In some I, capacity. I like my opinion originally was that he probably would have helped out with reconstruction. He might have been a bigger voice. Um, kind of like a long street or a Mosby had his opinions about it. But after, you know, doing the research for this episode, diving a little bit more deep into who he was and seeing how much of a home he felt that Helena, Arkansas was, I do agree with you that he would have been just wanted to kind of lead this quiet life, just go back and, you know, kind of like in a way like Wilder did with moving to Chattanooga and being very nondescript yeah. for the rest of his life. Like, I mean, you go to Wilder's grave, uh, John T. Wilder's grave in Chattanooga. You would never know what he did at Chattanooga. You would or at Chickamauga. You would never know he was the mayor. I d- I was thinking this morning. Oddly, I'm like, well, I bet Pat Claiborne eventually would have been the mayor of Helena, Arkansas. You know. Yeah, he he, he would have. He was always like politically. He was always kind of Hinman's sidecar, and it didn't and didn't end too well for Hinman when he went back. But I think I think he probably would have been somebody. Like you said, I think he would have stayed stayed home. He would have done he would have been with his family. I think he would have gotten involved in something. He would have been a civic leader somewhere in, in that area. Um, but I think that'd be about it. I think that's about as far as he was. I, and I don't think it was because he didn't have the capacity. I just think I don't think he had the desire. I think no. he was a soldier. I think he would have he would have felt that his job was done and now I did the best I could and I'm gonna live the rest of my life. I think yep. that's what he would have done. I agree too. Um, so Bjorn mentions that Claiborne's buddy Thomas Hinman went back to Helena, got into politics again, and then somebody murdered him within six yeah, months. Yeah, that's what we were just saying. It didn't end <laughs> didn't surprised. well to him. So <laughs> no, so so um, and so they, a couple. Yeah, um, the book couple, and the book about Je- the book about Jefferson Davis is called Jefferson Jefferson C. Davis is called Jefferson Davis and Blue. Um, yeah. but yeah, we do speaking of books. Speaking of books, the book club's coming up, and so we're going to be doing this book right here. I can see this or not. This is the fine book, um, a fine opportunity loss. Speaking of, um, speaking of post Chattanooga or Chickamauga and Chattanooga area, he um, it's a book by our friend Colonel Ed Lowe, who, who's down in that area, and it's a book specifically about Longstreet going to the Battle of Knoxville against um, yeah. against Ambrose uh, Burnside. But this there's some Claiborne connections into this. Claiborne was originally sent up to, to Knoxville, but when when Grant got to Chattanooga, he was called back. But but we're going to be doing this, I think it's April 16th, Mary, yep, right? At 7 so p.m. Eastern. 7 p.m. So if you are interested in, you can buy the book. It's an easy read. Um, yes. It's a it's a great book that if you're interest, interested in that part of the, of the campaign, definitely check it out. We'll have Ed on with us to talk about his book. And then we'll be announcing the rest of the book club at some point. We've got some other stuff. We're going to schedule with some other people as well. So we're looking forward to that. All right. So what's up for us next, Mary? I know we got some stuff to, to talk. We, 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 so have, we, have... we have the book club. We're going to have Dave Taylor on to uh, talk about his book. And we're probably going to have a few other guests on in the next couple of months. And we have to come up with some other episodes as well for ourselves to record. 
Um, but I posted the information about the book club in the chat. So Civil War Breakfast Club at gmail.com if you would like an invite April 16th at 7 o'clock Eastern to discuss A Fine Opportunity Lost. And the author, Ed Lowe, will be joining us. He's a really good guy. Definitely looking forward to that. So, all right, everybody have a great, we're going to jump off. So have a great rest of the uh, rest of the weekend. It's only Saturday, which is great. We did this on Sunday last time. It was yeah. pretty brutal, you know, the next day. So um, anyway, off we go. So Mary, again, uh, thanks for jumping on and always bringing it like you do. Like you always say. <laughs> but anyway, I guess do. have a great, great rest of the weekend. Hopefully uh, it warms up. It's going to be a rainy, crappy day here. So we're going to try to sit inside and do nothing today and then try to do something tomorrow. So hopefully your weekend as well. Stay safe. Stay warm. Stay dry. Go Boston College, Mary. Be yeah. you. Go Boston. Go BC. All right.